Okay, well, what I'd like to do, and I hope this doesn't get, uh, get us too far away from, <coughs> excuse me, the, what we're going to be looking at, but I'd like to read the text, and then I want to um, just give a, a bit of an exposition over, um, you know, how, how this fulfills, not only shows us that the Bible is, is the Word of God, but how it shows us that the God who gave us Scripture is the God that we see in the creation. Okay. But what I want to do is I want to read this prophecy, and after I give the exposition, we're going to come back to this, and we're going to read um, a, an exposition of how this was fulfilled. Um, it, it is, I do have some rather lengthy quotes, but they're very understandable, and I really didn't think I could improve on it. But what I did was I sort of took excerpts from the article and listed them out, giving us some numerous details of, of what happened in history and where the, these, these facts and this data came from uh, to show the absolute fulfillment of, of the passage we're about to read. So let's, let's begin by, um, by reading the, uh, the text. So Ezekiel 26, uh, verses 1 through 14, and, uh, you know, it's going to be on the screen behind me, but if you do have your Bible, it would be helpful to have it open as we go through the exposition of it. Okay, so we read, Now in the eleventh year, on the first of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gateway of the peoples is broken, it is open to me, I shall be filled now that she is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord. Now, I want you to notice, you know, again, the bottleneck to my prosperity is removed, Jerusalem is broken. This is the time frame of the captivity. So, this is what Tyre's looking at, Babylon's taking Judea into captivity, and their response is, great, now this means I'm going to prosper. Okay, well, because you've said that, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her debris from her and make her a bare rock. She will be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God, and she will become spoil for the nations. Also her daughters who are on the mainland will be slain by the sword, and they will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses, chariots, cavalry, and a great army. He will slay your daughters on the mainland with a sword, and he will make siege walls against you, cast up a ramp against you, and raise up a large shield against you. The blow of his battering rams he will direct against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. Because of the multitude of his horses, the dust raised by them will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of cavalry and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city that is breached. With the hoofs of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will slay your people with the sword, and your strong pillars will come down to the ground also. They will make a spoil of your riches and a prey of your merchandise Break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses and throw your stones and your timbers and your debris into the water. So I will silence the sound of your songs and the sound of your harps will be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You will be a place for the spreading of nets. You will be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Lord God. Now, one thing... The commentator I'm going to read is going to point out here is that we do have a, a direct prediction of what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do. But Nebuchadnezzar is not the one who, who scrapes it off, off the, uh, the land and throws it into the water. That's actually Alexander the Great. And one thing to notice is that there is a change of pronouns. At the beginning, you have, I will bring many nations against you. Okay? 
Then you have Nebuchadnezzar. And then you have this shift, and they, after it's talking about he will do this, he will do that, and they, also they will make a spoil of your riches. So, so it's shifting back to the nations. So we have many nations coming against Tyre, and we just need to understand that when we get to that text. Okay, so let's get a running start again back to where we, we were. I, I just want us to remember how the argument goes, okay? Now, we first prove God exists from the creation, and we need to do that to show that there is a possibility of there being a word from God before we attempted to prove that the Bible is that word. Secondly, we looked at the Bible's claim to be that word. We wouldn't want to really try to prove something that the Bible itself does not lay claim to. Thirdly, treating the Bible as reliable history we considered the several eyewitness testimonies of those who saw Jesus perform miracles. Again, doing things only God can do, which prove that He is a messenger sent by God, the God who created all things. Fourth, as God's messenger, Jesus asserted that the Bible, the Old Testament, Scripture, His words, what His apostles would write, and what his, their associates would write is God's Word, all given through the Spirit of Christ. And then last week we saw something that R.C. didn't address, but I think it's, it's interesting and, and I think it's legitimate, that of all the religions that claim that God exists or claim that some kind of a God exists and who claim to have a revelation from Him, only the Bible reveals, only the Bible describes the God that we see in the creation. So I hope you can see how all of this is, is lining up. Now tonight, we're going to move to a sixth argument, and perhaps the most potent objective argument to prove that the Bible is God's Word, and that is fulfilled prophecy. Now, the first thing I think we need to think about is what, what is prophecy, because it really can mean two different things in, in Scripture. It can either refer to foretelling or foretelling, okay? Now, foretelling means proclaiming, okay, proclamation. Foretelling is prediction. Now, God often sent His prophets to proclaim, okay, to reinforce what He'd already said. You know, we talked about before how God is in a covenant with Israel, which means that he has entered into a legally binding contract in which he will do certain things for them and they are to do certain things for him. And when they fail to do those things for him, he sends his lawyers after them uh, and those are the prophets to remind them of the terms of the covenant or the terms of the contract to um, also remind them of God's mercies and his grace that obliges them to keep this covenant and then to call them to repentance and renewed faithfulness, okay? So that is one aspect of prophecy, one work of the prophets, that is the proclamation of God's Word. And, and that, I should also mention as an aside, is the one thing that continues in the gift of prophecy today. As a matter of fact, the Puritans wrote books about how to prophesy. <laughs> and what they meant by that was not how to exercise the supernatural gift of telling the future or to reveal mysteries that only God can know through a supernatural word of knowledge. But what they meant was how to preach or proclaim what God has already told us in the Word, which is what the prophets mainly did. But they had a second function, and that's what we're concerned with here this evening, and that is that of prediction, okay? The kind of prediction that only God could do because He often gave these predictions to prove that the prophet had actually been sent by him. If what they said came to pass, they could know that it was the Lord who was speaking. Now, man, as we know, might be able to make short-term predictions based on current trends, you know, maybe in economics or politics, although they can often be wrong in, in the predictions that they make. But man has never been able to predict specific events in history 
that uh, were made, you know, these predictions being made years, decades, centuries, or even millennia before these things take place. We know that only God can do that because only God <clears throat> knows the future. Now, again, the God we see in creation is the only kind of God, the only God that, well, the only one that exists, but He's the only possible God who could know the future. Remember, the God that we see in nature is not limited, right? But He is infinite. And being infinite, I don't know if you remember this, but this is something that comes from infinity. He must be infinite in everything that He is, everything He possesses, which means He must also have infinite knowledge. Now, if God has infinite knowledge, that means He knows everything, right? And knowing everything, He cannot possibly be surprised. He cannot possibly learn anything new because He knows all. Okay, God knows what has happened in the past. God knows what's happening right now. God knows what's going to take place in the future. And you know, the interesting thing is too, God even knows what would take place under any given set of circumstances. Again, we have examples in the Bible where, you know, uh, Paul, for instance, on his way to Rome and, and the ship is, is being, you know, it's, it's locked fast in a reef and the, the waves are tearing it to pieces and um, well, you know, maybe it wasn't at that particular point, maybe a little bit before, and there were people who were trying to get off the ship in order to be saved, and the Lord says, if any of them leave, no one will be saved. So they all stay, and they're all saved. So God isn't necessarily saying, if any of them leave, I'm just going to destroy you all, but He's saying everybody needs to stay on board the ship for everybody to be safe, and they listen and that happens. God knows what would happen regardless of which direction you might take. And a very similar thing happened with David when he was in the city of, of I think it was um, Keilah, where he says, you know, I've, I've heard that Saul's coming. If he comes, will the people of the city hand me over? And he says, God says yes. And so David leaves. And so David's not there for the people to hand him over. <laughs> but God knows that would happen if he stayed. So anyway, God knows absolutely everything. And He doesn't have to look ahead to see, you know, what's going to take place because for some reason, he, you know, he, he just doesn't know. He already knows. He knows because, of course, it's a part of His plan. You know, He sees what we're going to do. He knows how He's going to respond to what we do or what He has planned to do uh, all along the way. And He's determined to let what he sees take place. And again, it's not just all permissive. God intervenes, you know, as he, as he will sovereignly. But as Jonathan Edwards said, and this is maybe a little bit different, kind of a little different take on the subject. If God sees that something is going to take place, it's going to take place. There's no doubt about it. And it's because if God sees it, he wills that it take place because otherwise uh, he would change it. And if he changed it, then he couldn't see that it was going to take place because it wasn't going to take place. So anyway, it gets a little bit complicated, but the point is God doesn't have to look ahead to see. He knows everything that's going to take place, everything that he has determined uh, to happen for his glory. So the question we're asking this evening is, is this, does the Bible contain predictions of specific events written long before those events took place, because if the Bible does, then it could only have been written by the one who has infinite knowledge, the one who knows what's going to take place in the future because he has determined that those things will take place. Well, the answer, of course, is yes. So the argument goes something like this. Only the infinite God of creation, only one who is infinite, who has infinite knowledge, can certainly predict the future. The God who is revealed in the Bible has predicted the future. Therefore, the Bible is God's Word. Now, again, as, as we think about this subject, we need to realize it's a very broad subject. We're just going to touch on it in, in uh, you know, a couple of Sunday evenings. Because how many prophecies are there? 
actually in the Bible. How many examples do we already have of fulfilled prophecy? I was trying to get a count because obviously I can't go through the Bible and count them all. It would, just, it would take longer than, than I would have in the course of the entire week. But estimates vary. Dr. J. Barton Payne, who was professor of Old Testament at Covenant Theological Seminary, in his Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, lists 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 in the New for a total of 1,817 prophecies. That's a lot of predictions, okay? Hugh Ross, and again, Hugh Ross may be a little bit controversial because I think he holds to a rather um, uh, old earth theory, but he was a former atheist, scientist, a Canadian astrophysicist uh, who was converted and is now a Christian apologist. He estimates there's roughly 2,500 prophecies in Scripture, 2,000 of which he believes have already been fulfilled. Okay, so for the next several Lord's Day evenings, we're going to look at 2,000 fulfilled prophecies. I'm just kidding. Uh, three is going to take actually quite a long time. But he believes 500 of them are yet to take place. And I would wager, although I don't know, I tried to find out whether Hugh Ross might hold to a position that sees Matthew 24 and, you know, the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 70th week, and the book of Revelation is yet future, and maybe that's how you populate and get 500 prophecies that haven't yet been fulfilled. But if those have been fulfilled, somebody was asking me earlier about preterism. You know, moderate preterism means that those passages that I just referred to were mainly fulfilled in uh, 70 AD. If that is the case, there really aren't that many things that haven't taken place yet. Um, the second coming, uh, the resurrection and the rapture, the final judgment and separation, and the cosmic renovation and the eternal state. Uh, not that many things yet future, which means that everything the Bible has predicted has already come to pass. Actually, if we had time to look at the book of Revelation, we'd see a number of amazing uh, predictions. Now, all this to, is to say that this is a, a vast and complex subject that would take years to go through everything that has been fulfilled. So again, we're just going to look at three examples, and one of them has to do with the city, Tyre. One of them has to do with Christ, and that's going to be, Lord willing, the 70th week of Daniel, and there is a prediction given by Gabriel to Daniel of exactly when the Messiah was going to come. And it can be demonstrated that he came precisely when Gabriel said he would come. And then we want to see the one that R.C., of course, um, uh, spent his time on in the last days according to Jesus, the one that Jesus made during his time on earth, which actually does encompass the book of Revelation. So we'll, we'll look at aspects of that. Now again, we're just going to look at the first one this evening. So tonight, let's consider the destruction of Tyre prophesied by Ezekiel. And here, I'm going to rely on a commentator who is, has done a lot of research and work on this. So, some, some lengthy quotes, but hopefully they'll, they'll be understandable. Now, first of all, Ezekiel wrote around 586, and I believe that is um, the, the third deportation, around the time of the third deportation. As you know, Nebuchad well, the, the northern kingdom was taken away earlier, but there were three times when Nebuchadnezzar came and took people, some of the Jews, out of Jerusalem and Judea and brought them to Babylon. And Ezekiel is one of those captives. I think he was taken during the second, um, the second deportation. But one commentator writes that this about the dating, okay? So he says, Ezekiel's prophetic message is one of the easiest to place in an accurate time frame. In verse 2 of the first chapter, the prophet noted, and by the way, you're not going to be able to get all these details, so just try to soak in the, the general thrust of this. In verse 2 of the first chapter, the prophet noted that his visions and prophecies began in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. The date for this captivity is virtually unanimous, unanimously accepted as 597 B.C., during the second deportation of citizens from Judea to Babylon, which is documented in detail in 2 Kings 24, 10 through 20. 
Furthermore, not only is the deportation recorded in the biblical account, but the ancient Chaldean records document it as well. Since Ezekiel's visions began five years after the deportation, then a firm date of 592 B.C. can be established for the beginning of his prophecy. The prophet supplies other specific dates, such as the seventh year, the ninth year, the eleventh year, and the latest date given as the 27th year. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but this chapter we're looking at started with the eleventh year, okay? Now, due to the firmly established dating system that Ezekiel chose to use for his prophecy, the date of the prophecy regarding the city of Tyre found in chapter 26 can be accurately established as the 11th year after 597, which would be 586. So this would be during that third deportation. Now, again, if you remember the geography uh, of the, um, the Middle East, uh, Israel happens to be that, uh, remember we already saw it's kind of a bottleneck uh, in a certain sense. God strategically placed Israel where they would be <laughs> in that natural land bridge between all these nations surrounding. And, um, you know, the uh, kingdom of Babylon was, was toward the east and they had to come over what's called the Fertile Crescent to come down into uh, Jerusalem in order to take it, but Tyre was a little bit further up, so they're having to pass by Tyre as they're, as they're coming, and it appears that um, perhaps Nebuchadnezzar attacked Tyre at the same time that the third deportation takes place. Now, this is what the commentator continues. The siege of Nebuchadnezzar took place within a few months of Ezekiel's prophecy, again, at the time of the third deportation. Josephus, quoting the records of the Phoenicians, says that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre for 13 years in the days of Ithabal, their king. And by the way, he references all this, so if you want, um, you know, the, the web page where this comes from, I can get that to you. The length of the siege was due in part to the unusual arrangement of the mainland city and the island city. While the mainland city would have been susceptible to ordinary siege tactics, the island city would have been easily defended against orthodox siege methods. Um, the historical record suggests that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the mainland city, but the siege of the island probably ended with the nominal submission of the city in which Tyre surrendered without receiving the hostile army within her walls. The city of Tyre was besieged by Nebuchadnezzar, who did major damage to the mainland, as Ezekiel predicted, but the island city remained primarily unaffected. So I hope you can see from this quote that Tyre was divided into two cities. Okay, there was the one on the mainland, which is the one prophesied regarding, it seems, and then the island in which they built another city. And that one was harder to get to. And uh, so that's, we're going to see how that works into this whole prophecy. So Nebuchadnezzar fulfills the part of the prophecy having to do with the destruction of the, of the city that's on the coast. But what about, what about it being scraped off the land and uh, thrown into the water? Well, the commentator continues. It is at this point in the discussion, now this is interesting, that certain skeptics view Ezekiel's prophecy as a failed prediction. Farrell Till, who is the editor or was the editor of the Skeptical Review. By the way, he's, he's skeptical no longer because he is no longer with us. So he knows the truth. But he said this, Nebuchadnezzar did capture the mainland suburb of Tyre, but he never succeeded in taking the island part, which was the seat of Tyrian grandeur. That being so, it could hardly be said that Nebuchadnezzar wreaked the total havoc on Tyre that Ezekiel cruelly predicted in the passages cited. Well, it wasn't Ezekiel's cruel prediction. It was God's judgment, right? Till and others suggest that the prophecies about Tyre's utter destruction refer to the work of Nebuchadnezzar. After a closer look at the text, however, such an interpretation is misguided. Ezekiel began his prophecy by stating that many nations would come against Tyre. 
Remember, we read that, so I said, have your Bibles open. Then he proceeded to name Nebuchadnezzar and stated that he would build a siege mound, he would slay with a sword, and he would do numerous other things. However, in verse 12, the pronoun shifts from the singular he to the plural they. It is in verse 12 and following that Ezekiel predicts that they will lay the stones and building material of Tyre in the midst of the waters. The shift in pronouns is of vast significance since it shifts the subject of the action from Nebuchadnezzar, he, back to the many nations, they. Till and others fail to see the shift and mistakenly, excuse me, lost my place. It's one thing I don't like about this tablet. You hit it in the wrong spot and suddenly, okay, so give me just a second to find. Okay, here we go. Till and others fail to see the shift and mistakenly apply the utter destruction of Tyre to the efforts of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, regarding the prediction that many nations would come against Tyre, the historical records surrounding the illustrious city report such turmoil and war that Ezekiel's prophecy looks like a mild understatement of the facts. After Nebuchadnezzar's attack of the city, a period of great depression plagued the city, which was assimilated into the Persian Empire around 538. Tyre was involved in the war which arose between the Persians and uh, Evagoras of Cyprus, in which the king of Egypt took Tyre by assault. Sixty years later, in 332, Alexander the Great besieged Tyre and crushed it. In his dealings with Tyre, Alexander asserted, by the way, Alexander the Great is you know, the great emperor of the Grecian Empire who conquered the worlds and brought the Greek culture to the world. Um, when Daniel is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue, you know, um, the... Um, you have the head of gold, which is Babylon. Then you have the Medes and the Persians, and we just heard about the Persians. But then the next one down is, is Greece. And um, so even, even the empires predicted during the days of Babylon what, what's going to take place. Just another uh, amazing uh, prediction. But in his dealings with Tyre, Alexander, again the, um, the king of Greece, asserted that he wished to make a personal sacrifice in the temple of Heracles on the island city of Tyre, apparently because the Tyrians considered their island refuge virtually impregnable, with war machines covering the walls and rapidly moving water acting as an effective barrier from land attack, they refused his request. Upon receiving their refusal, Alexander immediately set to work on a plan to, to besiege and conquer the city. He set upon the task of building a land bridge or causeway. Siculus, who is an ancient Greek historian, calls it a mole. That is, the, the, the causeway is, the land bridge is, he calls it a mole. From the mainland city of Tyre to the island city, Siculus stated, quote, immediately he demolished what was called Old Tyre and set many tens of thousands of men to work carrying stones to construct a mole. Curtius Rufus, who is a Roman historian, noted large quantities of rock were available furnished by old Tyre. This unprecedented action took the Tyrians by complete surprise. Fleming, who is an historian, noted, in former times the city had shown herself well nigh impregnable. That Alexander's method of attack was not anticipated is not strange, for there was no precedent for it in the annals of warfare. And yet, even though this action was unprecedented militarily, it was exactly what one might expect from the description of the destruction of Tyre given by Ezekiel hundreds of years prior to Alexander's actions. The mainland city was demolished, and all her stones, timber, and soil were thrown into the midst of the sea. In spite of the fact that the Tyrians were taken by surprise, they were not disheartened because they did not believe Alexander's efforts would prevail. They continued to maintain supremacy on the sea and harassed his workers from all sides, from boats that were equipped with catapults 
slingers, and archers. These tactics were effective in killing many of Alexander's men. But Alexander was not to be outdone. He gathered his own fleet of ships from nearby cities and was successful in neutralizing the Tyrian vessel's effectiveness. With the arrival of Alexander's sea fleet, the work on the land bridge moved much more rapidly. Yet when the construction of the bridge was nearing completion, a storage storm damaged a large section of the mole. Refusing to quit, Alexander rebuilt the damaged structure and continued to move forward. In desperation, the Tyrians sent underwater divers to impede construction by attaching hooks to the rocks and trees of the causeway, causing much damage. Yet these efforts by the Tyrians could not stop Alexander's army, and eventually the bridge spanned the distance from the mainland city to the island. Huge siege machines bombarded the walls of Tyre. Siculus's description of the fight is one of the most vivid accounts of a battle in ancient history. Eventually, the Tyrians were defeated, their walls penetrated, and Alexander's forces entered the city and devastated it. Most of the men of Tyre were killed in continued fighting. Siculus recorded that approximately 2,000 of the men in Tyre who were of military age were crucified, and about 13,000 non-combatants were sold into slavery. Other estimates, other estimate the numbers even higher. In describing the devastation of the city by Alexander, Fleming wrote, quote, there was a general slaughter in the streets and square. The Macedonians were enraged, that is Alexander's men, enraged by the stubborn resistance of the city and especially by the recent murder of some of their countrymen. They therefore showed no mercy. A large part of the city was burned, close quote. The secular historical record detailing Alexander's destruction of Tyre coincides precisely with Ezekiel's prophecy concerning what would happen to its building materials. As Ezekiel had predicted, the stones, timber, and soil of the mainland island were thrown into the midst of the sea in an unprecedented military maneuver. For Ezekiel to have accurately guessed the situation would be to stretch the law of probability beyond the limits of absurdity. His acutely accurate representation of the facts remain as outstanding and amazing proof of the divine inspiration behind his message. Now again, it was not just what happened to Tyre on that one particular occasion, but the fact that God was going to bring wave after wave of opposition from the nations until he had destroyed Tyre. Now, again, this is just one example of many uh, prophecies in Scripture of various sorts, but, um, you know, not the least of which would be his prophesying destruction of various nations, such as that of Babylon. And again, think of Nebuchadnezzar's um, statue with the various metals and, and how the prophecy goes on in the book of Daniel to describe what these kingdoms would do the destruction of Egypt and Assyria, Edom, Syria, a host of others. Now, the point is that the Bible contains these predictions and that they come to pass with amazing accuracy hundreds of years later is proof of the supernatural origin of Scripture because only a God who has infinite knowledge could possibly predict what's going to take place in the future. And again, that's what we have in the Bible. What we see in creation is a God who is infinite. So again, we see the perfect fit between what God reveals in creation and what He reveals in His Word, showing us that the Bible is, in fact, the Word of the God we know exists from the creation. Now, next time, we're going to consider a prophecy related to the coming of Messiah, you know, with, with, um, with, with regard to Christ because He is the central character and, and the burden of, of Scripture. There are over 300, it's probably more than that, 300 prophecies concerning Him. Uh, we're not going to have time to look at all of those, but we are going to just maybe mention a few, but look at the one that um, actually dates when He's going to come. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, even though he gave such a prophecy, uh, those that, that had possession of it didn't know 
<laughs> you know, when he was coming, which uh, is interesting. It, it took the Magi from, from the East, you know, the, uh, the wise men, the Chaldeans. Uh, God had revealed it to them, and they came looking for the king when nobody in Israel was, was doing it. Now, that, um, I think, uh, would have to do with his birth, but this prediction of when he was going to come is a prediction of when he would present himself to Israel as the Messiah and begin uh, his ministry. Well, let's go ahead and, and close here. And um, let's, again, uh, since this is primarily a lecture, um, let, let's just go ahead and, and close with um, another hymn. And I changed the hymn because I, I had chosen El Shaddai because it was referring to, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ and we're not looking at that particular prophecy, so I thought we would uh, do another hymn. And as I mentioned before, you know, as we as we look at.